Welcome to another segment of the ongoing series, Veterans Remember, produced by HCAM Studios on Main Street. <coughs> you are indeed fortunate to be able to see and hear history unfold before you. One-on-one -on -one conversations with Hopkinton veterans is an opportunity to document the military history of hundreds of men and women from town to this day who serve and are being served in the service in a variety of ways in a variety of places. Uh, I'm Hank Alessio filling in for Dick Gooding who's the assigned facilitator but with a scheduling snafu. Uh, I'm on temporary duty. Uh, TDY to those who remember the term terminology. Uh, I served two years on active duty beginning February 1962 in the Army Signal Corps. Sharing the lens with me tonight for this session of Veterans Remember is a well-known and popular Hopkintonian, Paul Phipps. Paul is so generous with his time for Veterans Matters and a numerous other town-wide affairs. Welcome, Paul. Good to be with you again. Glad to be here. <coughs> um, as the good troop <coughs> that you are, I understand you were extremely early. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one day early. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, I could have caused that with our telephone conversation okay. the other day. If it, if it was me, I apologize. Okay. Uh, Paul, uh, during the onset of World War II, Hopkinton had a population of about 3,000 about one-fifth of what it is today. You must remember the small town. What was it like then? Well, <clears throat> you exaggerated. <clears throat> <laughs> the population was about 2,000 when I was growing up back in the uh, uh, 20s and in the early 30s. And it was um, a case where we knew everybody in town. We knew where they lived, how many people were in each house, what they did, and uh, what their activities were. And uh, there were no secrets. And mostly our uh, land area was uh, agricultural, mm -hmm. farming. The, the entire area of the town, which is now housing, was mm -hmm. all farms, mm -hmm. mostly uh, dairy uh, farms. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were... Uh, <coughs> There were no secrets. Everybody knew everybody else's business. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with virtually everybody involved in some way, uh, what was the mood in town, in the country, before you entered the service? What, what were the circumstances of your joining? Well, of course, Pearl Harbor, number one. Uh, I was at the Holy Cross in college in my uh, senior year. And uh, our first thought was to respond, and we did. I think there were about 20 of us from the college that immediately signed on with the Marine Corps. We, we took our oath in March of 42, not too long after 41. Mm -hmm. And um, this uh, group uh, was supposed to finish a college, was supposed to graduate, and the Marine Corps had told us that their personnel needs were such that we would be able to graduate. But about the 1st of December, we got a, a letter countermanding that, saying that their needs had changed. We were now going to report on the 30th of December. So we would have graduated in February uh, because the uh, classes had been speeded up because of the war situation. And we, we were going to... Uh, <coughs> graduate in February of uh, 40, what? 40, 42. 43, you mean. And as a result, we were on a train uh, to New York City uh, on the 30th of December. Uh, we lost our Christmas vacation, and uh, we uh, arrived at, at uh, Paris Island uh, two days later. We, all gathered together in New York and went down on a sleeper train. And that's when the fun started. All the drill sergeants yanked us out of the, uh, out of the trains and uh, insulted us left and right, and reminded us that we were no longer citizens as such. Uh, we were no longer uh, 
to uh, consider anybody our parent but the sergeant in charge of our training. So that uh, that's when it all started. And five years later, I came home. Yeah. I'm delighted that you came home, as yeah. others are. In, well, in uh, Hopkinton yeah. High School, uh, what was the size of your graduating class? I think we had 26. 26 in our class. And roughly 50-50 male, female? Uh, probably about 60-40 female. Huh. Yeah. And, and of, the, of the boys, what percent ended up in the service? Oh, I would say probably 80% anyway. 80%? Yeah, I would say. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. With, with everybody just about that you know, uh, serving in some way or another uh, in, in such a small town, was it easier to commit to the service or was it more difficult to commit to the service? No, it was, I think it was understood that we would do that. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't any debate. Uh, there was, uh, I, I don't recall uh, anybody uh, uh, objecting to the mm -hmm. fact that we were all going to be going in service, we expected to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we accepted it as, as a duty, and we mm -hmm. did it. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And when you entered, you were an enlisted man. Uh, and when you came out, you were an officer. Uh, what was the process or the path that brought about your commissioning? How did you get there? Well, at Paris Island, <clears throat> we were there for three months, basic training, which was uh, Converting you from a civilian to a to a uh, marine, <laughs> and then uh, in April we were transferred to Quantico to uh, officer training. We did another three months there, so six months total. And in June of of uh, forty three, uh, we were commissioned. So it happened and, fairly quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah six months, yeah. six months. And uh, in fact, I was married <clears throat> on the day I graduated with my commission. June 30th, I was married to my wife, Ruth. Uh, that started our 65 years of marriage, oh, by the way. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, upon entering in those early days, what was your training? Uh, where were you? you know, and, uh, how did they prepare you for what was to come? Well, all phases, uh, marching, drilling, coordination, discipline. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the... That's what it was all about. Uh, we were uh, uh, under very harsh discipline and uh, rifle range. We had to learn weapons. And uh, mostly it was the discipline of uh, doing what you're supposed to do when you're told to do it. And you suddenly realize that uh, your rights are limited. Uh, were you ever that far from Hopkinton before? Uh, no. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I, I, I think my attitude was, I'm here uh, to perform a duty, and uh, whatever they ask me to do, I'll do. I, I didn't fight the system. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, uh, became an officer, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then was assigned to a uh, uh, replacement battalion, and uh, sent to uh, Camp Lejeune for training. And eventually we uh, took a train across country uh, to the West Coast, spent a few weeks there, and then on a board ship, and we were overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, What's uh, awed me when I get to know people like you in town, uh, Hoppington being so small, 2,000, yeah. not 3,000 at the time, yeah. there were six Marines, you and five others, yeah that experienced the Battle of Iwo Jima. Oh, yeah. To me, that is something. Yeah. Uh, at the time, it was the bloodiest battle the Marine Corps had ever been in. And we didn't see each other over there either. That was my question. <laughs> Did you ever see anybody on the island? Uh, yes. Of but, those other five? Not, not of my group, no. Uh, no, we lost, a, we lost a good buddy from the Holy Cross football team, Jim Scondrist. Uh, he was killed. Uh, I think the second day after we landed. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <clears throat> no, I, I ran into uh, a buddy of mine, uh, 
who was, became my best man, actually, Joe Matthew from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and I had a reunion uh, on Iwo Jima, but it was the day after Jim Scondrus was killed. Oh. So we shared that mm -hmm. a tragedy. So yeah. after Iwo, uh, was there any opportunity you know, say on the way to Okinawa to meet up with the Hopkintonians at all, or did you just not see them at all? No, I was at Pearl Harbor. I was uh, stationed at a base in, in, in Pearl Harbor for several months, and different ones from Hopkinton would come through. Tom Brown, the postmaster here, was also in the postal department in Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor, and he was sort of a central meeting house. We, mm -hmm. we all would gather with him. In fact, I recall one time Ray McMillan was another one, that we uh, would commandeer a recon truck and uh, fill a, a case full of beer and take <laughs> a tour of the island, you know. Mm. So Tom was the, the host for most of those parties. Mm. Mm. Well, I, I, there's no graphic details that are necessary, but uh, I s sense that whatever happened in Iwo and, and thereabouts, it has to have affected you till today. I mean, it's just got to have been life-changing. <laughs> Yeah. That, yeah, that, that was something that we took in stride, too. Uh, mm -hmm. We accepted, at, at that age, you know, we're, we're still kids in their early 20s, mm. uh, we never gave a thought, I, I don't think, a serious thought to the fact that we wouldn't survive. Mm. If, if you started thinking that way, you were in real trouble. Yeah. But we, uh, we never thought that way. We were there to do our duty mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully survive. And uh, some of us did. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this uh, sounds like it changes the subject somewhat, but uh, not really. When, when I first learned about Hopkinton High School's Athletic Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. I also learned that you were earning varsity letters since ninth grade, the archetypical jock. Yeah. <laughs> and I've got a feeling there's a sports story somewhere in your Marine uniform. Why don't you share that with us? Your baseball team. And a baseball team? Yeah. Well, it was a strange thing that uh, I landed, you might say, some cush jobs overseas at Pearl Harbor. And uh, the commanding officer of our unit uh, had checked my background, I guess, <clears throat> and they needed a morale booster, so they said, we want to organize a baseball team. So they called me in and said, you know, that was you're the, you're the coach. And we had a team of about 25 players, and they were in all different companies, battalions. And when we needed to practice, we'd call them out, and we'd get them to practice. And we played, when we were back in the rear areas, we played 85 ball games. And we played against, there were a lot of major league ball players out there at the time. Johnny Mize was out there, and Pee Wee Reese, and, Luca Della, when any number of those fellows were there, and we played against all of them, with them, and, and against them. And uh, we did that. Uh, when we came back from Iwo Jima, why, they called me in again and said, for morale purposes, we want to reorganize that team. So we were on Maui, the island of Maui, and we <clears throat> reorganized the team. And we were preparing for the landing on Japan, unfortunately. And we, uh, we played about 45 games on Maui. Mm -hmm. And again, we played against major league ball players. So it was an interesting experience. And it was a, it was a break for me because away from duties uh, as an officer of training and so forth, I was able to find relief uh, through baseball. Mm -hmm. And it worked out very well for me. And some of those fellows, went on, one of them went on to play in the major leagues. And uh, we, they were mostly professional ball players, college players, and so mm -hmm. forth. So that was a very fortunate uh, assignment for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I think uh, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but uh, I find it interesting. Uh, the team that Paul coached and played on uh, was uh, before the military was integrated, yeah. and his team were uh, black players. and. Uh, Paul culturally was ahead of the curve. Uh, that's a nice baseball yeah. metaphor because he doing that in 46 and Jackie Robinson didn't uh, arrive in the major leagues till 1947. Yeah. So uh, our 
Paul Phipps uh, uh, was culturally ahead of the curve. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great story. We broke the color line. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, that was a team that uh, <clears throat> they had lost their catcher. That was after the war. Mm. And uh, I was in charge of the, all of those teams. And uh, we were at practice one day, and uh, I was a catcher. So I put on the catching material, and I, I caught batting practice and so forth. And after <laughs> practice, well, they all gathered, and they came over and said to me, Lieutenant, uh, will you catch for us? We've lost our catcher. He's been discharged. <laughs> and so this was a totally black team. There was no integration there at all. So I said, well, I'll have to ask the commanding officer. And I did. And he said, well, he looked at me sort of strangely. He said, you want to do this? <laughs> and I said, I do. So he said, well, go ahead. And we did. We didn't have an incident. We didn't have a problem at all with it. Uh, <laughs> there were all the people we played. We played civilian teams, and we played uh, service teams. And they all respected the fact that because I was in charge of the team, I had to play. You know, mm -hmm. So they, they wrote it off that way. Mm -hmm. So it never became an issue. Yeah. Well, uh, you brought a, a lot of show and tell things, Paul. And some of them look fascinating. Yeah. Why don't we uh, go through some of those? And well, this, uh, this is one picture here. If you can show it. Is that yep. over there? Was that short? That was taken on uh, Iwo Jima uh, on the beach. We were leaving. Uh, we were about to go board ship and come home and come back to Maui. And uh, this is a uh, Suribachi in the background here. And the, my sergeant, for some, I don't know how he did it, but he concealed an old fiddle, the violin, in his pack. I don't know how he salvaged it, but he did. And he was serenading the troops here on the beach at, at uh, uh, on Iwo Jima. <clears throat> this incidentally is, is the uh, patch for the third amphibious, third amphibious corps, uh, our patch, uh, which we wore. And this other item is actually something, it's, it's a battle map of, uh, of Iwo Jima. <clears throat> this is Suribachi, right here at the point, that high point you see a lot. That's where the flag raising, the famous mm -hmm. photo was taken. And uh, there were three airfields here. And this is the battle, this is the official battle map of the island. We landed in this area, mm -hmm. as you can see, it looks pretty, pretty level there. Mm -hmm. So that we, uh, we landed uh, all along this, this shore here, because mm -hmm. the rest of it was all rugged, very rugged mm -hmm. territory. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's Iwo Jima. Okay. Nice place to be from. Right. Now this, this is just an example of medals, various medals, and I won't get involved in them because everybody's. Turn it around. There you go, like that. I got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Everybody would have their own set of, of medals, all different. These are not very famous. We had a commendation medal, Navy Unit Commendation, Occupation of Japan. I was able to participate in that, uh, in the occupation. And uh, so the, everybody uh, has their medals, and some of them have, I decided to put these together so that, uh, to preserve them. And, and that is an explanation of what they are, that's all. And, and, and I might add, Paul is quite modest. They're not illustrative, they're his medals. Oh, yeah. but, <laughs> and he should be very proud of them as we are. Uh, and anything from behind there, do you think? No. no. Well, uh, here is our, uh, uh, our coach and catcher. Haha. Uh, -ha. I yes. don't know where that, where did that come from? That I don't know, picture? that was stuck in the middle. Oh, of it must have place. fallen out. Yeah. I think that's a great shot. I yeah. wish we had that in the photo gallery. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah we might you, you yet. Can, you can put it in it. All right, yeah. done, done. Uh, 
Uh, now, I had a, a few incidents when I th think of the of, of the, the color lines and the problems that we had in the Corps when I was at uh, Camp Lejeune or Montford Point Camp. Uh, I'd been in charge of the football teams and the baseball teams, and we had access to aviation. Cherry Point was a marine aviation, mm -hmm. and uh, they used to provide us uh, f flights to Georgia and so forth to play football. And uh, I looked in my records, and I had a, uh, a listing of a team we had played from South Carolina, and I booked them for a, a weekend, like the Marine Corps birthday is November 10th, so the 11th and all, was a big weekend. And uh, I booked this team to play, and uh, two days before the, the game, I, I got called to the main gate. There was a team there on a bus, and it was an all-white team. And uh, I was, they said, are we in the right place? And I said, well, yes. I took it to my file and so forth. Well, to make a long story short, uh, I was called on the carpet for trying to create a f an incident. You know, <laughs> I had taken right out of my files, and they sent the wrong team. They sent the white team instead of the black team. Oh wow! So uh, uh, I, I was involved in that. So I can say that I had a lot of racial issues when I was in the service, mm -hmm. and they were all resolved very well. My my NCOs, my black NCOs, were great people. They they cooperated very well. They uh, calmed everybody down that weekend. We were, you could have had a riot very easily. And they, uh, uh, they, they carried it off very well, and I'd say I had a great staff there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, inspired leadership. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh. it, it was a learning experience, and I say that's one of the things about the, the, the Corps, the Marine Corps. You can talk about battles and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think that the experience of going through the, the training sessions and the uh, experience of joining and working with troops, being responsible for troops as well as being among them, was a, a great life experience. And I think that a, a year and a half or two years of military training for young people would be very, very helpful. It teaches them discipline. Uh, self-discipline as well as discipline uh, mm. to others. That's a good uh, point. Is, is there anything else that you can share about Hopkinton's military lore through the eyes of Paul Phipps? I know we have a lot of Marines in Hopkinton. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happened, but they did, and, and they were all great fellows, and some of them had more vivid experiences than I did. I was very, very fortunate. I, I might have been uh, subject mm -hmm. uh, to, to a fatal accident and so forth mm -hmm. very easily, but I wasn't, so I'm one of the lucky ones. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, uh, I think that the real heroes are those that, that didn't make it, that didn't come back, gave their lives. And uh, we... Uh, <clears throat> We learned a great deal uh, from the experience. Gives a great respect for one another, for one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we have a great camaraderie, those who served in the service and served during uh, conflicts and so forth, have a camaraderie that uh, can't be replaced. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very real. Mm -hmm. And that's why you'll see veterans uh, so willing to uh, turn out and be a part of the community and help one another. Well, I can attest to that with my little project that I'm doing, and I thank you for being so willing and quick to help with that photo gallery with your pictures. Yeah. I thank you for participating in the monthly breakfasts at the uh, Senior uh, Center. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I can uh, <clears throat> tell you that your comrades enjoy being with you. Yeah. And I hope you come to the next one, Friday. Well, Friday. <laughs> We'll be there. Yeah. No, we're very, uh, I think all of us who survived are obviously very grateful for that and uh, willing to give some of our time. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. Uh, there you have it, Hopkinton. Another good reason for you to be proud uh, and secure. Uh, thanks for watching.
Bob, lighting all set? Looking good, Jim. Thanks. Okay, guys, the quickest 26 minutes you ever had. It's going to fly by. All right. Tom, you ready to go? Yep. You're mostly on the guest with some over the shoulder shots. John, yeah. you're going to be mostly on the host, but get ready to truck right and give me some shots with both of them. Gotcha. Burl, at 15 minutes in, we need to cue them for a 60 second break. Got it. Thanks. You want one of these? Send me an email. I'll pull a few names out of a hat. Finally, I keep it. <laughs> Thank you. You had bologna and cheese, you had PB&J, and I had PB&J. Hey, I like your shirt. What's Be Free? Well, Be Free is a group of people in Hopkinton that helps kids make healthy choices about drugs and alcohol. What do you mean by that? Well, it means that we all work together to choose to do other things. What kind of things do you mean? Well, you tell me. What other things can you do with, besides drinking and smoking? Play outside. Four square. Mm -hmm. You can play wiffle ball, or you could even have a picnic. Hmm. Aren't we too young to think about drugs and alcohol? You're free right now, but when you get older, sometimes it gets harder to make healthy choices, but we always want you to feel like you can be free. There are many ways to get involved with the Be Free Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Project in Hopkinton. It's never too early to teach your children your values around drugs and alcohol. To get more information about the Be Free Project, visit BeFreeProject.org. You found the channel and you've watched the shows. Now, find out how the magic happens on Inside HCAM.